everybody, welcome back to the channel and uh, thank you for being here. So today we're gonna talk about a really important topic, inflammation. Um, it's a buzzword that's going around right now and I think that maybe not a lot of people understand like how important it is to our body in terms of being beneficial but also being harmful or pathologic. So we're gonna go into the nuts and bolts of inflammation and because this is a, such a complex topic, this probably will be a video series to be honest with you. It'll, it will be a, 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 a a kind of defining video of what inflammation is, uh, how it goes awry, and then things that can be uh, caused by chronic unchecked inflammation and what kind of disease processes are um, affected by that. And then we'll have another video series kind of about like, okay, now we know we have inflammation, how do we check for it, and then what do we do about it to get it to come down. According to Nature Immunology, and from July 2017, inflammation is generally defined as a response to a stimulus by invading pathogens or endogenous signals such as damaged cells that result in tissue repair or sometimes pathology when the response goes unchecked. Okay, so what it's trying to say is that inflammation is a necessary and needed process to overcome infections or to, you know, to repair things that are damaged. If you were to get in a car wreck or if you were to break a bone, you need inflammation in order to get over that process. So we're going to explain how that happens kind of in, in detail here pretty soon, but it also shows that when it's unchecked and unnecessary inflammation and chronic inflammation, that's when pathology or diseases can come up and that's the things we don't want to happen. So inflammation is clinically seen with classic signs described in Latin as rubor, calor, dolor, and tumor. And in English, that would be redness, warmth, pain, and swelling. When you're, when, for example, when you sprain an ankle, it swells up, it becomes painful to touch with movement. If you contract cellulitis or an inflammation of the skin, which is generally caused by streptococcus or, or staphylococcus bacteria, um, you'll note that the, 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 the skin area becomes painful, red, uh, warm, there's swelling involved, and that is what we call acute inflammation in action. So here right now is a picture of what Oops. acute cellulitis looks like. Um, you'll see on the on the right, you'll see that the, 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 the extremity is clearly red, the, ex the extremity is clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, edematous or, or, or swollen compared to the other one, and I can guarantee if I touch that guy's leg uh, that it's going to be painful as all get out. So that is what acute inflammation looks like, and that is a normal process, that is a necessary process, that is your body trying to fight off that uh, infection, and that is good. So to reiterate, inflammation in general should be good, and it's absolutely necessary for human health. It's how we kill off viruses, bacteria, parasites, whatever uh, is attacking our body, that's how we get rid of it. If we happen to get in a car wreck and break a bone, we need inflammation to help repair that bone, and any impairment of that process could impair the healing process. So. Inflammation in general should be good. However, we don't. What we don't want is we don't want chronic, unchecked, unnecessary um, inflammation because that's where it can cause disease, and that's how we're going to talk about um, in the future coming slide. Okay. So as you can see in this paper, the International uh, Anesthesiology um, Journal here, um, cytokines uh, are small secreted proteins that are released by cells that have in a specific effect on and interactions between and, and communication between cells. So a cytokine is basically a small protein that has some either local, aka autocrine effect, or some far away uh, you know, paracrine or endocrine effect on other parts of the body. And there are both pro-inflammatory cytokines or cytokines that you know elicit inflammation and, and kind of uh, ramp up inflammation, and then there are anti-inflammatory cytokines. And this is how your uh, immune system basically communicates with itself to either bring up you know, inflammation or uh, wind down inflammation. So this next picture is kind of like explaining that in a, in a picture format. So you can see on the left, you have lymphocytes, which are white blood cells. You have macrophages, which are white blood cells, granulocytes, white blood cells, mast cells, white blood cells. Fibroblasts are what make uh, you know, basically collagen, um, tissues, endothelial cells is a very generic term, but you know, they can be inside your blood vessels, they can be inside your stomach, there's lots of different places where endothelial cells are at. Those all went under damage, right? Uh, for example, if you were to damage the inside of your vessels, the endothelium of your vessels, that, that can release cytokines. Or if your collagen, you know, and your skin is damaged, then the fibroblasts may release cytokines. Or if your, I don't know, your lymphocytes or your macrophages or whatever start to detect, detect an antigen from a bacteria or virus, or even debris from damaged cells, they can start to release cytokines and they can act on each other to ramp e themselves up as you can see on the right 
it can it basically like it will release cytokines and then we'll have a signal to the whatever the target cell is and then it'll have some effect and we'll talk about what those effects when we think about inflammation and the, the granddaddy of what uh, kind of like signals inflammation we, we want to talk about something called NF kappa B or nuclear factor kappa B and as you can see in this uh, slide that inflammatory signals aka cytokines um, damaged cellular components um, even even like reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress markers can then signal the body to start to uh, ramp up NF kappa B, which then signals kind of almost like amplifies and as a microphone or a megaphone, hey, make a lots and lots of more of these inflammatory cytokines and things like that to get inflammation ramped up. So in, you know NF kappa B uh, has been shown to be kind of like when it's turned on constitutively or like all the time or unnecessarily that is like the molecule that can you know potentially lead to cancer and all, and, and all kinds of different things that we don't want to have so a lot of times when we target um, inflammation as a, as, a, as a doctor or as a clinician we generally will be sometimes sometimes working at that at that level of the NF kappa B level so this is an important molecule to discuss when we talk about inflammation so, the next thing we want to talk about is um, basically a, a process called the uh, cyclooxygenase and the lipooxygenase pathways. And um, it's a little bit biochemically, uh, so biochemical sounding, and I understand that that's, you know, can be a little confusing, but the bottom line is, um, what I really want to highlight here is that arachidonic acid um, is a molecule that you can take in from your diet, usually in animal foods, and then it can also be converted to arachidonic acid, you know, things, something, can, something can be converted to arachidonic acid from omega-6s, okay? So when we talk about why we care about omega-6, omega-3 ratios later in this series, then that's how we're going to, that's why we care, is because basically, even though omega-6s are a uh, essential fatty acid, um, omega-6s are the pro-inflammatory or the the fatty acid that are essential that will then create inflammation when it's necessary and arachidonic acid does the same thing whereas the omega-3s which I don't have a picture of on this particular slide um, omega-3s are in general anti-inflammatory and they provide they provide a different uh, set of chemical messengers when they're broken down so this is this is kind of just again highlighting that omega-6s will create uh, arachidonic acid and then arachidonic acid is kind of the master kind of the um, how do I say this arachidonic acid is the precursor molecule to a lot of the inflammatory signals that um, a lot of us have heard about and so the, the, this next picture is now talking about arachidonic acid and what it breaks down to so arachidonic acid breaks down uh, through these cyclooxygenase or COX enzymes um, so COX 1 and 2 and LOX enzymes, lipooxygenase, to make all these uh, prostaglandins and uh, prostacyclins and leukotrienes and stuff like that, which then have uh, inflammatory um, signals. And when those are unchecked, that's when we have a lot of the stuff that we don't want to have. So if I was to give someone, for example, um, steroids like you know prednisone or dexamethasone or solumedrol or something like that, it's going to act on nuclear factor kappa B. It's going to act on um, phospholipase A2, which is that, which is the enzyme that breaks down arachidonic acid to these uh, prostaglandins and stuff like that. It's, and then it's going to also block Cox enzymes. And now, when we give something like, for example, um, ibuprofen or Aleve or something like that those are cox inhibitors uh, and, and they will they will they will block the cyclooxygenase enzymes um, and so that's that's how they exert their effect on, on on the body so if you can see here so for example uh, the under the cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme you're going to see that that's going to be responsible for making platelets more sticky together so that can increase your risk for heart attack and stroke um, it's also important for making sure that the uh, GI system is uh, kind of like making sure it has plenty of um, protection from the acidic environment of the stomach um, for example on under the cyclooxygenase 2 enzyme you're going to see that it's going to be responsible for you know basically ramping up inflammation even further, uh, potentially even cancer, neo neoplasia and carcinogenesis is basically the same word as, as, you know, basically can lead to cancer and recruitment of further white blood cells and, and basically kind of like amplifying again um, inflammation. And then the same thing with 
the LOX enzymes or the lipooxygenase enzymes. You're going to have vasoconstriction, which is basically where the vessels contract. You're going to have um, bronchospasm, which is where the, the, the lungs contract and can lead to asthma and stuff like that. So this is, this is responsible for a lot of pathologic processes we have in the body that we want to kind of shut down. Now, we need this sometimes, right? If there's an acute inflammation and you have uh, bacteria or something like that you're trying to get rid of or there's, a, there's an injury or something like that, we need these things to happen. It's, it's when this is unchecked, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, it's, it, you have more cytokines that are created, so there's further inflammation, and then it can lead to inflammation, joint destruction, atherosclerosis is another name for hardening of the arteries or having plaques in the arteries. So this is something that um, later on, if it's unchecked, can cause a lot of damage and a lot of you know, pathology or disease processes in the future. So the, I think the, the, some of the questions that may, you may have at this point is, okay, so we know that this arachidonic acid is uh, maybe not uh, ideal to have um, a lot of, you know, in terms of a ratio. I think, it, I think it also is important to know, well, what kind of things would set off these um, arachidonic acid pathways, you know? So let's say it's there, so how does it get set off? Well, it can get set off by the cytokine molecules like we talked about, so when something ramps up with inflammation. There's something called a toll-like receptor. A toll-like receptor is a very, um, is a, is a, is a, it looks for what they call uh, pathogenic molecular uh, kind of patterns. So it's something that maybe looks like a bacteria or maybe looks like um, a daemon cellular component and that can set it off. Even things like oxidative stress can set this off. So the bottom line is there's many things that can set this process off. Generally, it's stuff that we don't really want to have. We don't really want to have viruses. We don't want to have, and those things are good to set that off. But if it's reactive oxygen species or, or inflammation caused by things that we don't need to be setting off inflammation, then it's going to amplify that pathway and create disease. So this next slide is, is, is really the crux of the matter. Okay. It kind of really distills what we've really been talking about here. Okay. So when we have an injury or an infection, these chemical messengers are released into the, the bloodstream, into the, into the system to ramp up inflammation. And as you can see, under the physiology, the blue part, right, on the bottom, you have these in inflammatory cytokines that are released, acute inflammation happens, you have these, these PGE2, PGD2, these are these, are these uh, prostaglandins we're talking about. And then there should be a resolution, right? Because the ideal outcome is there's a resolution, you return to like your homeostasis or like kind of a normal state, and then you kind of go on with your, with your life. However, when you have a pathologic process, there's no resolution, there's this chronic inflammation, and then you start to get damage of the, the inner line, the tissues around it, um, which, which causes disease that we don't want to have, right? So as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, you're going to see that there's actually these phases, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, but there's these phases, you know, minutes to, to, you know, seconds to minutes, minutes to hours, hours to days of how this is supposed to kind of resolve, depending on the injury, of course, that you have. You basically You'll, you'll want to clear these pro-inflammatory cytokines, these pro-inflammatory cells, such as like neutrophils and macrophages and stuff like that. You want to clear this out so that the inflammation goes away. It's when the, the process fails, you know, um, is when it really becomes a problem. And that's, that's really when we talk about inflammation, and a lot of other people talk about inflammation being bad. That is what we're talking about. When the inflammation fails to, to resolve and it just continues and continues. And we're going to talk about how that could be bad. When we hear... Uh, a doctor or, or a, a, med, a medical professional talk about inflammation. How do we know what we're talking about as an inflammatory process? Well, generally, we add the word itis to the end, right? So if someone comes in and they have gastritis or colitis, that generally means that there's some inflammatory you know, component to this pathologic process. Um, a lot of these, it doesn't, that doesn't necessarily say if it's chronic or acute, uh, which means it's not from like a, a very short amount of time frame. So if you have acute gastroenteritis, that would be something that usually is caused by a bacteria or, fung uh, or, or a virus, and that's going to cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, some inflammation in the stomach, and it's going to go away very likely in a couple of days, right? But if you have like this chronic colitis, or you know, like Crohn's, or ulcerative colitis, or collagenous colitis, or these different other chronic col you know, colitis, then, then that would be a, a more chronic condition, and that's something that we definitely don't want to have, right? So anytime you hear itis, I guess my point is, that's when you know that there's likely an inflammatory component to that disease process, and that could be bronchitis. I mean, there's just, itis is everywhere. Right? There's chondritis, arthritis, you name it. Um, the bottom line is, almost all disease processes have some inflammatory component, and that's why this is so important. So you're going to see in this next slide that um, chronic inflammation 
is likely related to about darn near everything that you don't want to have, okay? So if we go, let's say we start at the top uh, left, cardiovascular disease, so atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, related to inflammation chronically, heart failure, related to inflammation chronically, strokes, hypertension, I would even say hyperlipidemia or pathologic hyperlipidemia, which means elevated cholesterol that is damaging to the body. Um, Autoimmune diseases, uh, IBD stands for inflammatory bowel disease, which would include, include Crohn's disease, uh, colitis, uh, lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, type 1 diabetes. These are all autoimmune diseases. I would even throw in Hashimoto's thyroiditis there. Um, a lot of autoimmune conditions uh, are, re are related to a chronic inflammatory condition. How is type one, type two diabetes, or fatty liver disease, or renal failure? Well, we can talk about that in the future. Um, bone diseases, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, which is also an autoimmune condition, can be related to chronic inflammation. Um, anybody who's dealt with asthma, COPD, acute or chronic bronchitis, is an inflammatory condition. Diabetic complications, neuropathy. Again, this is kind of this is a little bit redundant. Hypertension, which can be led. Basically, I think is what what it's trying to say is that it you know when you have diabetes and you have complications of diabetes, it can lead to due to the inflammation, hypertension, and atherosclerosis, and then neurologic conditions such as depression, Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis again, and then of course the 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 thing that no one definitely wants to have is cancer of any type. That's it's been well established that cancer has a huge chronic inflammatory component to it. So I think this is where I'm going to leave off um, with this video. I think we probably covered it enough. Um, I suspect that you'll have a lot of questions um, after the after the end of this video, and I'll be happy to answer them in the comment section. Just leave them at the bottom. Um, and then I'm not going to leave you hanging completely. The next video we'll be talking about, well, now we know that chronic inflammation is bad compared to the acute inflammation, which is good uh, in some settings. And so what, how does this how does this relate to disease processes? I mean, we see this slide that's showing that all these disease processes are, are related to cancer, are, excuse me, are related to um, uh, chronic inflammation, but really, like, can you be a little more specific about why it's bad? And so we're gonna do that in the next video. So again, if you have any questions, leave them down below. We'll answer them in the comment section. And until the next time.